Thanksgiving is a wonderful time, not merely for family and food, but Thanksgiving is a time of giving thanks to God who has given to us all that is necessary for life and godliness. And as we look back at the history of our country, we find that there are many times where this nation, as a nation, gathered not merely to thank God, but to repent of their sins, to humbly beseech Him for His blessing in the continued year. Sadly, our nation has gotten away from those things, but today we have the opportunity of reading some of those great proclamations of the past, and if you did not get a bulletin, uh, there are some on the table right outside the door. Uh, we hope that you pick that up because it gives you a list of the different things that I will be reading today by way of remembering this Thanksgiving season. Even though perhaps those of our leaders are not thankful, yet we as believers who understand that all has come from Jesus Christ, we are indeed very thankful. The first proclamation that I'll be reading is actually the Mayflower Compact, dated November 11th, 1620. Governor William Bradford. In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have here under subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our Sovereign Lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, that is, year of our Lord, 1620. John Carver, William Bradford, Edward Winslow, William Brewster, Isaac Allerton, Miles Standish, John Alden, Samuel Fuller, Christopher Martin, William Mullins, William White, Richard Warren, John Howland, Stephen Hopkins, Edward Tilly, John Tilly, Francis Cook, Thomas Rogers, Thomas Tinker, John Rigdale, Edward Fuller, John Turner, Francis Eaton, James Chilton, John Craxton, John Billington, Moses Fletcher, John Goodman, Deggery Priest, Thomas Williams, Gilbert Winslow, Edward Margeson, Peter Brown, Richard Bitteridge, George Soule, Richard Clark, Richard Gardiner, John Allerton, Edward Doty, Edward Leister. That was the Mayflower Compact. One year later, the first Thanksgiving Day was held in 1621. June 29, 1671, the first known official Thanksgiving proclamation was given at Charlestown, Massachusetts by the City Council. June 20, 1676. The Holy God, having by long and continual series of this afflictive dispensations, in and by the present war with the heathen natives of this land, 
written and brought to pass bitter things against his own covenant people in this wilderness, yet so that we evidently discern that in the midst of his judgments he hath remembered mercy, having remembered his footstool in the day of his sore displeasure against us for our sins, with many singular intimations of his fatherly compassion, and in regard reserving many of our towns from desolation threatened, and attempted by the enemy, and giving us specially of late with our many confederates many signal advantages against them without such disadvantages to ourselves as formerly we have been sensible of, if it be the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed, it certainly bespeaks our positive thankfulness. When our enemies are in any measure disappointed or destroyed, and fearing the Lord should take notice under so many intimations of his returning mercy, we should be found an insensible people, as not standing before him with thanksgiving, as well as lading him with our complaints in times of pressing afflictions. The Council has thought it meet to appoint and set apart the 29th day of this instant June as a day of solemn thanksgiving and praise to God for such his goodness and favor, his many particulars of which mercy might be instanced, but we doubt not those who are sensible of God's afflictions have been as diligent to espy him returning to us, and that the Lord may behold us as a people offering praise, and thereby glorifying him. The council doth commend it to the respective ministers, elders, and people of this jurisdiction, solemnly and seriously to keep the same, beseeching that being persuaded by the mercies of God, we may all, even this whole people, offer up our bodies and souls as a living and acceptable service unto God by Jesus Christ. And people tell us we have no Christian beginnings for our country. The first national Thanksgiving proclamation was a congressional proclamation made on November 1st, 1777, by the President of the Continental Congress, Henry Lorenz. Forasmuch as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to Him for benefits received, and to implore such further blessings as they stand in need of, and it having pleased him in his abundant mercy not only to continue to us the innumerable bounties of his common providence, but also to smile upon us in the prosecution of a just and necessary war for the defense and establishment of our unalienable rights and liberties, particularly in that he hath been pleased in so great a measure to prosper the means used for the support of our troops and to crown our arms with most signal success. It is therefore recommended to the legislative or executive powers of these United States to set apart Thursday the 18th day of December next for solemn thanksgiving and praise, that with one heart, at one time, and with one voice, the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor, and that together with their sincere acknowledgement and offerings, they may join the penitent confession of their manifold sins, whereby they have forfeited every favor, and their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and to blot them out of remembrance, that it may please Him graciously to afford His blessings on the governments of these states respectively, and prosper the public counsel of the whole, to inspire our commanders both by land and sea, and all under them, that with wisdom and fortitude which may render them fit instruments under the providence of Almighty God, to secure for these United States the greatest of human blessings, independence, and peace, that it may please Him to prosper the trade and manufactures of the people, and the labor of our husbandmen that our land may yield its increase, to take schools and seminaries of education so necessary for cultivating the principles of true liberty, virtue, and piety under his nurturing hand, and to prosper the means of religion 
for the promotion and enlargement of that kingdom which consisteth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it is further recommended that servile labor and such recreation as though at other times innocent may be unbecoming the purpose of this appointment be omitted on so solemn an occasion. By order of Congress, Henry Lorenz, President of the Continental Congress, November 1st, 1777. When was the last time a leader of Congress invoked the blessing of the Holy Spirit of God? 1789, the Presidential Thanksgiving Proclamation by President George Washington. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the benefic beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be that we may then unite all in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country, previous to becoming a nation, for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, for the great degree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government for our safety and happiness, and particularly the national one now lately instituted for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed, and the means we have of acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge, and in general for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions to enable us all whether in public or private stations to perform our several and relative duties properly and punctually to render our national government a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise just and constitutional laws discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed to protect and guide all the sovereigns and nations, especially such as shown kindness unto us, and to bless them with good governments, peace and concord, to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue, and the increase of science among them and us, and generally to grant unto all mankind such a degree of temporal prosperity as he alone knows to be best given under my hand at the city of New York, the third day of October, Anno Domini, that is, year of our Lord, 1789, George Washington. In 1791, the New Jersey Governor's Thanksgiving Proclamation was issued by William Patterson. Proclamation. Whereas it is at all times our duty to approach the throne of Almighty God with gratitude and praise, but more especially in seasons of national peace, plenty and prosperity, I have therefore thought fit by and with the advice and consent of the Honorable Privy Council to assign Thursday the 8th of December next to set apart and observed as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer for the great and manifold mercies conferred upon this land and people, and particularly for the abundant produce of the earth during the present year for the spirit of industry, sobriety, and economy which prevails, for the stability and extension of our national credit and commerce, for the progress of literature, arts, and science, and for the good order, peace, and plenty 
and the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed, and also that we may unite in our supplications and humbly implore the almighty ruler of the universe that he would be pleased to continue his protection and goodness to this land and people, to smile upon all schools and seminaries of learning, to promote agriculture, manufactures, and commerce, to illuminate and guide our public councils, to bless our national and state governments, to enable us all to discharge our official, social, and relative duties with diligence and fidelity, to eradicate prejudice, bigotry, and superstition, to advance the interest of religion and the knowledge and practice of virtue, and for this purpose to pour out His Holy Spirit on all ministers of the gospel, and to spread the saving light thereof to the most distant parts of the earth. Given under my hand and seal at arms at Trenton, the 21st day of November in the year of our Lord, 1791. William Patterson. By His Excellency's command, Bowes Reed, Secretary. When was the last time a governor of New Jersey prayed that the people would pray for their ministers and that through them would pour out his Holy Spirit of the gospel to spread the saving light thereof to the most distant parts of the earth. I'm glad to say that happened in our state. 1863, the Presidential Thanksgiving Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. I invite my fellow citizens to set apart a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. Washington, D.C., October 3rd, 1863. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed, that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations. Order has been maintained. The laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict, while that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceable industry to the national defense have not been arresting the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements and mines, as well as the iron and coal and is of precious metals having yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding that waste that has been made in the camp, the siege and the battlefield, and the country. Rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance these years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by whose American people I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, 
and fervently implore the imposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purpose to fulfill enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, in union. In testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of these United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this third day of October 1863 and of the independence of the United States the 88th. Abraham Lincoln by the President of the Senate and Secretary of State William H. Seward. Now in contrast, the 2014 Presidential Thanksgiving Proclamation of President Barack Obama. A proclamation. Thanksgiving Day invites us to reflect on the blessings we enjoy and the freedoms we cherish. As we gather with family and friends to take part in this uniquely American celebration, we give thanks for the extraordinary opportunities we have in a nation of limitless possibilities. And we pay tribute to all those who defend our union as members of the armed forces. This holiday reminds us to show compassion and concern for people we have never met, and deep gratitude to those we have, who have sacrificed to build the most prosperous nation on earth. These traditions honor the rich history of our country and hold us together as one American family, no matter who we are or where we come from. Nearly 400 years ago, a group of pilgrims left their homeland and sailed across the ocean in pursuit of liberty and prosperity. With the friendship and kindness of the Wampanoag people, they learned to harvest the rich bounty of a new world. Together they shared a successful crop, celebrating bonds of community during a time of great hardship. Through times of war and peace, the example of a native tribe who extended a hand to a new people has endured. During the American Revolution and the Civil War, days of thanksgiving drew Americans together in prayer and the spirit that guides us to better days. And in each year since, our nation has paused to show gratitude for our families, communities, and country. With God's grace, this holiday season, we carry forward the legacy of our forebearers. In the company of our loved ones, we give thanks for the people we care about and the joy we share. And we remember those who are less fortunate. As shelters and soup kitchens, Americans give meaning to the simple truth that binds us together. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. We remember how a determined people set out for a better world, how through faith and charity of others they forged a new life built on freedom and opportunity. The spirit of thanksgiving is universal. It is found in small moments between strangers, reunions shared with friends and loved ones, and in quiet prayers for others. Within the heart of America's promise burns the inextinguishable belief that together we can advance our common prosperity, that we can build a more hopeful, more just, and more unified nation. This Thanksgiving, let us all recall the values that unite our diverse country, and let us resolve to strengthen these lasting ties. Now therefore I, Barack Obama, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim Thursday, November 27, 2014, as a National Day of Thanksgiving. I encourage the people of the United States to join together, whether in our homes, places of worship, community centers, or any place of fellowship for friends and neighbors, and give thanks for all we have received in the past year. Express appreciation to those whose lives enrich our own, and share our bounty with others. In witness whereof I have hereto, hereunto set my hand this 26th day of November, in the year of our Lord 2014, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 239th, Barack Obama. How have the mighty fallen? Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 797. Come, ye thankful people, come. Number 797. Let's stand to sing. Thankful people come, raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, 
reading this morning is the text upon which I'll be preaching. This is Jonah chapter 2. My specific text is verse 9, but I'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. God's word for his people. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted, Within me I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today with a voice of thanksgiving. Oh, how much we have to be thankful for in spite of our evil, wicked, rebellious sins. 
You have been good to us. You have blessed us above all that we could ask or think. As we come into your presence, Father, we come humbly, knowing that we deserve nothing. But you are the God who in mercy and in grace has pardoned our sins through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ. You, through your mercy and grace, have given us your word whereby we might know you, the true and living God. You, by your mercy and grace, have placed in every believer in Christ your indwelling Holy Spirit. You have showered upon us bountiful love, tenderness, and kindness. You have indeed blessed us with prosperity in a land far exceeding the wealth of other lands around the world, though we deserve it not, for we have forgotten you as a national people. Many today will not even have the thought of God cross their minds. Many today will exercise their gluttony, their covetousness, their malice and hate, their sloth, their anger, their envy. Father, let it not be so with your people. As we give it a fellowship, it is around your table, for all that sits at that table came from your hand. Cause us to have truly thankful hearts, not complaining hearts not murmuring hearts like Israel in the wilderness. Help us to know that you feed us daily with the manna from heaven. Help us to understand that you give us of the living waters to drink. Help us to understand that as a shepherd you lead us through the barren wilderness to a place of shelter and rest, of sustenance and refreshment. Father, we come before you with thankful hearts. You are good and worthy to be praised. You are not only God, you are our God. And we are the sheep of your pasture. With tender hands you have brought us thus far. And you set before us the future to serve you to love you, to obey you, to walk in paths of righteousness that others might know the way to follow as they see us reflecting Christ. Father, we thank you that you have brought us to this hour where corporately we might lift our voices with a song of thanksgiving and with a voice of praise. Bless our time of worship together, Father. Fill us with your joy and with your peace and cause us to go forth with thanksgiving to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. On Thanksgiving, we take a special offering. You have a notice down there at the bottom of your bulletin. All the gifts in those specially marked Women's Missionary Society envelopes will go to the Women's Missionary Society. This is one of the events that they account on for some of their offering. Any designated funds will go as directed if those are section or session approved designated funds and all the rest of the offerings will go to the church. And so uh, as we gather this morning you are certainly welcome to participate in any of those three offerings in the same offering basket. Oh, good. 
standing and take your bulletins and on the back of the bulletin is the hymn thanks to God we'll sing the one that's on the back of the bulletin thanks to God for my Redeemer Thanks for all the God's provide. Thanks for times now but a memory. Thanks for Jesus by my side. Thanks for pleasant balmy springtime. Thanks for dark and dreary fall. Thanks for tears by now forgotten. Thanks for peace within my soul. Thanks for prayers that thou hast answered. Thanks for what thou dost deny. Thanks for storms that I have weathered. Thanks for all thou dost supply. Thanks for pain and thanks for pleasure. Thanks for Thanks for grace that none can measure. Thanks for love beyond compare. Thanks for roses by the wayside. Thanks for thorns the stems contain. Thanks for homes and thanks for fireside. Thanks for home, that sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope in the tomorrow. Thanks for all eternity. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Sometimes it's still hard for me to think about those who've gone before us. Well, we've just read a passage out of Jonah, a passage that the entire chapter is inside the belly of the fish. I think the prophet Jonah lived during the reign of Jeroboam II from about 782 B.C. to 753 B.C., and as you know, before Christ, the numbers count down rather than counting forward. Everyone's familiar with the miracle of the monster fish that God prepared to swallow Jonah so that Jonah would get back on track with the mission that God had given him to do. I think most people, however, are unaware of some of the details of the passage that we've just read and 
how it relates to thanksgiving. For example, I believe that all of us have probably heard the statement, salvation is of the Lord. That's a favorite quote by many evangelists. It's a favorite quote by Calvinistic preachers who want to emphasize that there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. Even the Arminians like to use that quote. It has power because it shows reliance upon a powerful God. But I suspect that if I had not just read those words out of the book of Jonah, if instead I had taken a show of hands just by reading that phrase, that most folks would probably have guessed that those words came from the New Testament. In fact, you probably would have guessed Paul, and in fact, probably scratch your head and think, now let's see, is that in the book of Romans? Salvation is of the Lord. <laughs> you know, if I told you, no, it's not in the New Testament, and I told you the phrase was in the Old Testament, I think that most people would probably have guessed, hmm, that sort of sounds like the psalm, salvation is of the Lord. Or maybe it's Isaiah, or maybe it's Jeremiah. Or if you were really sharp, you might have guessed the book of Lamentations, because we find a similar passage both in Psalms and also in Lamentations, but the exact quotation is in Jonah. Let me give you those two that are very close to it, one out of Psalms and one out of Lamentations. Psalm 37, 39. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Or out of Lamentations chapter 3, verse 26. It is, a, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Close, but not quite the same. Salvation is of the Lord. Those words are found only in the book of Jonah. In fact, they were uttered during the first and only Thanksgiving Day service held in the belly of a sea monster. No doubt there have been other panicky prayer meetings held as people were being eaten by sharks, pulled under by giant squid, and swallowed by, in whole by ancient seagoing dinosaurs. When the passage begins, Jonah is having one of those prayer panics. But that is not what triggered a monster-sized vomiting session. It was when Jonah gave thanks to God from the belly of the fish that God told the fish to spit out its lunch for the day. Thanksgiving was pouring out of the heart of Jonah when those words of God's sovereignty and salvation were spoken. Thanksgiving and acknowledgement that God is the sole source of salvation are the words and the attitudes that triggered that vomiting session not at the bottom of the ocean even, but up onto a beach. As we go through the passage today, that's a good thing to remember. Jonah was having a bad day. We might say so. <laughs> I think that most of us have had bad days periodically. When we have a bad day, unfortunately, we tend to groan and to complain. Perhaps we get sullen. Perhaps when we have a bad day, we get bitter. Perhaps we blame God. At least, we usually blame somebody else and not ourselves. As we just read through this passage here, did it ever occur to you that God plans and prepares sea monsters that come into our lives? He does it to help us get back on track with what he's called us to do. God prepared a bunch of things in the book of Jonah. It tells us that specifically. And God prepared the great fish to eat Jonah. It was God's way of saying, I love you, Jonah. <laughs> now most of us don't like that way of God saying, I love you. But if you look at the book of Jonah, this was God's way of saying, I love you, Jonah. In fact, I love you so much that I have personally prepared a surprise party for your going away trip. <laughs> Did you also notice that the point at which God knows that he can disengage us from the monster is when we learn to say thank you to him 
for what he is doing. When we learn to admit that we can't handle it ourselves, when we acknowledge that truly salvation is of the Lord. Let's just see how serious Jonah's problem was. Let me just read a few select phrases out of that those ten verses that I read to you. Jonah 2.2 2. Out of the belly of hell cried I. I think this was pretty serious from Jonah's perspective. Verse 3 For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the flood compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. How many of you have ever been in danger from the ocean, from water? Perhaps an undertow was pulling you out from shore. I've been in some of those situations. I can remember as a very small child, I was perhaps six, seven years old. My family was away at Ringgold, Louisiana, at a Bible memory camp. And um, one day, uh, I was late for one of the meetings that was going on, and so rather than walk in and be embarrassed, I just sort of wandered down to the edge of the lake where there were some of the boats tied that all the campers were allowed to go out in. And I was way too little to row a boat, and the boat didn't have any oars in it. But I climbed into the boat anyway, and it was very loosely tied to the dock, and as I was just sort of sitting there in the boat looking around, the line loosed, and the boat began to drift into the center of the lake. And I thought, oh no, there's no lifeguard here. <laughs> in fact, there's nobody here. Nobody can see me, and it's too far away from where the meeting is taking place. They can't hear me if I holler. I thought, I could jump out. I do know how to swim. But I thought, that probably is not a smart idea. So I sat in the boat. And I sat there for about an hour, drifting farther and farther to the center of a very large lake. At least it was a very large lake as far as the little boy was concerned. And at the end of that hour, of course, my parents had been frantically looking all over the campground for me. And at last they saw this tiny little dot out in the middle of the lake. You know, I was only a child, but I was praying. <laughs> I was setting up a lot of flare players, prayers. <laughs> and of course, they sent somebody out to get me. Wasn't anywhere near as scary as Jonah's experience. I've been in the ocean where you can feel the undercurrent and the tow pulling out. You have to learn to swim along parallel to the shore until you can get back in. Uh, it's cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. The floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. It was not a calm sea. Listen to the spare of his soul. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Not a very theologically accurate statement, but it was Jonah's panic. Have you ever prayed and the heavens seemed like brass and there seemed to be no answer? The water has compassed me about even to the soul. His internal terror, not just physical terror. The death closed round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Some of you have seen the various large masses of seaweed that float in the ocean at different places. Think of falling into some of that, being swallowed by a sea monster. And as you are going down, this stuff is all tangled around you. Jonah! Jonah is in that predicament. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. You know, there are mountains underneath the ocean. There are gigantic crevasses. The Mindanao Strait. There's a sound there, a deep crack in the earth nearly seven miles deep. Think about how long a mile is if you had to walk it on flat ground. Think about going down to the greatest crack on earth to the very bottom with all the water on top. The earth with her bars was about me forever. 
You know, that sounds pretty serious to me. Even if Jonah managed to pry open old gruesome mouth, he was way down at the bottom of the ocean, a long way from the surface. But you know, God is always there with the impossible situation for those who trust in Him. There are four things here in this text that show us why God delivered Jonah. Number one, Jonah knew the correct God to whom to pray. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, all capitals, that's Jehovah, Yahweh. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God. The second thing that is so key in this text is even though he was going through the most terrifying situation that can be imagined, he had a personal relationship with the true God. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God. The third thing that we notice in the text, Jonah remembered with longing the place of worship where God had chosen to put his name. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Now, folks, stop and think about that for a second. Here is Jonah in the belly of a fish, heading to the bottom of the ocean, and he thinks about the temple. That boggles the mind. He was thinking about the temple, and he was doing it in faith. I will look again toward thy holy temple. Faith is what pleases God. Faith is what moves his hand to answer our prayers. And number four, I think this is so important. Jonah never questioned God. He knew that God was sovereign. That's clear from the text. He knew that God was doing this. He told that to the sailors before they threw him overboard. Did you catch that phrase? For thou hast cast me into the deep. He didn't blame the sailors for it. For thou hast cast me into the deep. Jonah knew that he, Jonah, deserved this slap upside the head. He didn't blame somebody else for his problems. He didn't blame the ship's captain for stupidity and in sailing into the storm. He didn't blame the sailors for doing a bad job. He didn't blame the travel agent for scheduling a bad ship, bad date, and bad time. He laid the blame squarely upon himself. He knew that he had jumped into his own stew. Now, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we, like Jonah, start out thinking that we can either outsmart God or get out of his assignment by sneaking out the back door. That's the bad move. That's the stupid thinking. You know, after the I was eaten by a monster experience that he could then tell his grandkids, he apparently didn't learn his lesson, even though his initial gut reaction was quick enough, right enough, and he got delivered. His old bad attitudes were still in his heart even after he got saved. You know, some of our bad attitudes are still in our hearts, too, even after we're saved. And that, by the way, should be proof enough that we still have our old sin nature after salvation. And even a glorious salvation experience, and Jonah had a glorious salvation experience, does not eradicate the old nature. That won't be gone till we get to heaven. So, did you notice that Jonah reverted back to his bad attitudes even after the hungry fish experience? We know this from the next two chapters because that gives us hope. Because God was still working on Jonah. God did this marvelous deliverance. And then Jonah goes right back to his old bad attitudes. But God didn't give up on him. And God doesn't give up on us. Even when we fail over and over again, God kept preparing other things to use in Jonah's life. God keeps preparing things to use in your life as well. God continues to prepare and place other learning experiences in our lives. None, of course, were as terrifying as the sea monster, but they were certainly enough to get Jonah's attention. You remember what God prepared? It says God prepared a gourd plant 
to shade Jonah while he waited in his ringside seat for God to kill some people. Almost reminds you of the people sitting in the arenas watching gladiators or Christians getting eaten by lions. Here's Jonah thinking, boy, now I get to sit back and watch God kill some people. That is sad. He was anticipating a good show. But then God prepared a worm to kill the gourd. Some little thing can destroy that which is so important and significant to us. How big is a worm? Think about what you love most. Think about what you enjoy most. Think about what you desire most. Think about what you covet most. Think about what is your pet sin. Think about what is a blessing that God has given to you that you so much rely on. And then think about a worm. God prepared a worm because Jonah's attitude was not right. And the worm killed the gourd. Wrong death. He was looking for the death of people. He got the death of a gourd. And then God prepared something else. God prepared a blazing hot east wind to blast Jonah. Oh, God could have made it ten times hotter. But you know, God can protect you from even the hottest east wind, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the three Hebrew children who were cast into the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looked in and he says, Did we not cast in three? But lo, I see a fourth, and his countenance is like the Son of God. And they are walking and loose in the flames. If you're in fellowship with him, it doesn't matter how hot the blast of the east wind is. But Jonah wasn't in fellowship. Jonah, like most of us, was pretty obtuse when it comes to figuring out how God was dealing in his life. He reverted back to his old carnality. He reverted back to his old hatred of the Ninevites. He reverts back into feeling sorry for himself. He, he reverts back into bitterness. He reverts back into sounding like a carnal American Christian who doesn't get his own way. But God wants to get our attention by the things, now listen carefully, that he lovingly prepares for us. All of these were indicators of God's love, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. God wanted to get Jonah's attention and he wants to get our attention by the things he lovingly prepares for us. God wants us to learn to trust him. That's faith. Jonah showed it at that crisis moment in the belly of the fish. He wants us to learn to call on him. He wants us to learn that he's sovereign, that we have no right to complain no matter how bad it is. God wants us to thank him even in the most difficult monster attacks in our lives. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything that includes the monster attacks. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I think that you're aware from our studies on Sunday evening that the will of God is never thwarted. In other words, God guarantees that we will learn to give thanks. What do you want to go through to get there? He guarantees we'll learn thanks because he is sovereignly able to bend events. He is even able to bend entire historical sequences in our lives to bring us to the point of thanksgiving. Let's go back for a moment to the monsters in our lives. As you're slipping down the throat and seeing the jaws snap shut just as you slide over the tongue, and you're feeling the goo and the slime as the churning stomach juices slap seaweed around your head and you feel the elevator heading down to the bottom of the ocean. Does it ever occur to you that there might be a reason related to how you are responding to God's will for your life? Do you think, hmm, I wonder if God is trying to get my attention. After the initial terror, when you know that you're caught, 
Do you flip, as did Jonah on that occasion, do you flip into the automatic pilot mode of faith? When you face the monsters and there is no escape, is there a longing in your heart to be in God's house and fellowship with his people? That's what Jonah thought about. After his initial flare prayer of terror, does your heart immediately shift into believing the promises of God based on his unchanging character? Jonah did. We tend to remember Jonah's carnal and bitter spirit. But Jonah was a man chosen by God. Jonah was a choice vessel used by God. Jonah was a man loved by God. Jonah was a man prepared by God, trained by God, commissioned by God, empowered by God, sent by God, directed by God, pursued by God, recommissioned and resent by God, followed up on by God, accompanied by God's presence, tested by God, further instructed by God, emotionally engaged by God, intellectually engaged by God, spiritually disciplined by God, and designated a prophet of God. That's Jonah. Don't just remember his sin. Except for that last connection with God that is designated a prophet by God, Jonah is just like us. We are chosen by God. We are choice vessels used by God. We are loved by God. We are prepared by God. We are trained by God. We are commissioned by God. We are empowered by God. We are sent by God. We are directed by God. We are pursued by God. We are recommissioned and resent by God. We are followed up on by God. We are accompanied by God's presence. We are tested by God. We are further instructed by God. We are emotionally engaged by God. We are intellectually engaged by God. We are spiritually disciplined by God. Jonah is just like us. All those things that were said about Jonah can be said about us. And Jonah was given to us, according to Scripture, to teach how God deals with those that he loves and those whom he sends to do his work. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 6, Now all these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Verse 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Hebrews 4.11 Let us labor therefore to enter into rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know, as we look at that passage, it's not just an interesting children's story. It should be a story that gives us hope that God never gives up on those whom he has chosen. And because of that, it should fill our hearts with thanksgiving. It should fill our hearts with praise. It should cause rejoicing and great thanksgiving. In fact, it should cause as we see in our text, a song of thanksgiving to rise in our hearts. God loves us. He saves us in spite of our miserable carnality, stupidity, stubbornness, rebellion, disobedience, and recalcitrant spirits. God still has a purpose for us. God still has a use for us. God still wants us to be in fellowship with him. Doesn't that make you want to sing with thanksgiving? I hope so. The Bible tells us that the lack of genuine thanksgiving is one of the principal marks of a decadent culture about to be cursed and judged by God. You see it as you contrast the various proclamations of thanksgiving over the last few centuries. That should never describe the believer. The unbelievers, the reprobates, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Romans 1.21 We can. We must be thankful. Colossians tells us the same thing. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Verse 15 deals with thanksgiving. Verse 17 deals with thanksgiving. And squarely smacked between those two is singing. Singing in the context of thanksgiving. The voice of thanksgiving is a singing voice. Those who refuse to sing to the Lord are telling something about the status of their hearts. 
Thanksgiving is on both sides of the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in this passage. When we put God back on the throne of our hearts, when we get our lives back in track with thanksgiving, his peace rules our lives. It also produces a thankful spirit. It sets the stage so that God, the word of Christ can dwell in us richly. The thankful heart will delight to teach and admonish with music, psalms, and hymns, and spiritual songs. It will fill our hearts with what the text calls singing with grace to the Lord. It will change our lives so that whatever we say or do will be in the name of the Lord Jesus. Remember that last phrase, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You cannot give thanks to the Father without Jesus. And because of Jesus, your heart, if it is truly regenerated, must give thanks because of Jesus. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will make us a thankful people, that our hearts will be filled with singing and with rejoicing because you continue to love us. You continue to work with us. You continue to mold and shape us into the image of Christ. You do not let us go. You track us down. You follow us up. You are the hound of heaven. And you bring us to yourself. How we thank you. How we thank you. With joy. With peace. With hope. And with love in our hearts. For Jesus who gave his all for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 794, Let All Things Now Living Return.